wing was that we didn't want any gas. We wanted no fossil fuels. Yeah. Our whole thing was how are we going to heat the place and cool the place without burning any fossil fuels. So like I said, if you look at any of these units, you'll see throughout the campus, you'll see these water to air heat pumps. And the water to air heat pumps, there's 59 of them yeah. in the ceiling around here. They vary in tonnage from two ton up to, I think the biggest one we have is a 10 ton in the greenhouse. But most of them are two to three ton. Now when I say ton, what that means, uh, one ton is 12,000 BTUs. So okay. if I say a two ton is 24,000 BTUs, three ton 36 and so on. That's what it'll provide in heating or cooling. So what these do is, you have a water coil where our ground source fluid flows through the water coil. You have an air coil where the refrigeration system puts their refrigerant through to either heat it or cool. And then they have a very crucial part of these is the reversing valve. And what a reversing valve, you know your fridge at home, you have a warm on the back and cold in the middle. What we do on these is, of course, we have a warm coil and a cold coil in the refrigeration. If we're in air conditioning, we put the warm coil into the water. In other words, we transfer the heat into the water, dump it into the ground. When we're in heating, we flip those coils, we put the air coil as the heating part and the cold coil in the water, and we put the cooling and suck the heat out of the ground fluid. Um, and that's the very simple pro process of how a ground source system works. You're taking either heat out of the ground yeah. or you're putting heat into the ground by means of a refrigeration cycle. And that's how we do it with these systems here. So we have 59 water-to-air heat pumps that do the air heating in the system or cooling in the system. What we also have is all the, the around the, the perimeter of the building, because this building is slab on grade, the slab tends to get cold. So what we did to solve that was we put five feet in from all outside walls is heated with, with in-floor heating. The far end of the building, as you all know, is full of computers. The computers yeah. are a 12-month of the year cooling load. We're always calling for cooling down at the far end of the building. So what we do in the wintertime, instead of rejecting that heat into the ground and wasting it, yeah. we put it into the, into the floor and we heat the floor. Also, all around the building, you'll see the interlock. The interlock is all snow melt. So we use that heat to melt the snow. That way we don't have to put any chemical on the interlock for snow melting. Right. We don't have to do any shoveling, so we don't have labor you know, for staff to shovel it. And uh, it keeps, if you notice, it's probably the cleanest sidewalks around the college because there's no, there's never any sand on it or anything. Because there's no, you know, it's always dry yeah. because of the snow melt. So that again is the heat we're rejecting from the computer wing is melting the snow on the interlock around the building. The other thing when you're building a building, and, and this building has to fall under building code, you got to bring in 15 CFM of fresh air, cubic feet per minute of fresh air per person. This total capacity of this building is 600 people, is the, what they figured would be in it at the maximum. So we got to bring in about 10,000 CFM of fresh air. Now, are you, are you talking about this building, the new, the new, just the this new building, wing? Just this new wing. Right. Just this new wing. Now, so we got to bring in about 10,000 CFM at full capacity. In a standard building, what we would do is there'd be a unit on the roof and it would just open a damper and suck in 10,000 CFM of cold air and somewhere there'd be a fan exhausting 10,000 CFM of stale air outside. Right. Very inefficient. You've got to pay to heat that and you're dumping what you've just paid to heat out through right. the window. So what we put on the roof here, if you look on the far end up by the green roof, yeah. you will see there's a big unit there, a big gray colored unit. And what that is is a heat recovery unit. So what we do is the air that we are exhausting, we transfer the heat from it to the fresh air that's coming in by means of a heat wheel up there. That's one of only three units in Canada that's as efficient as it is for transferring the temperature. Even doing the transfer on a really cold day like last night, we still need to do a little bit of preheating of that air before we dump it into the, into the space. So how we do that, we take the heat that we reject and we, we above the computers and we put it into the hot water to heat preheat that air before we dump it into the space. The other thing that this building's kind of unique in, most buildings, they everything runs as if the building was full. In other words, when it's occupied, all the fans are running full speed, all the pumps are running full speed, everything's running full speed because you assume the space is occupied. What we do here is if and if you look at the walls, you'll see you see those two white boxes over on the wall over there? over by that girl sitting there under the... Oh, yeah, under yeah. One of those is a temperature sensor. One of them is a CO2 sensor. So we have 24 CO2 sensors throughout this campus, this building. And what we do is we sense how many people are in the building by how much CO2 is in the building. We all breathe, right. we all exhale CO2. When you put 
100 people into that classroom, the CO2 level rises. We sense that on our building management system, and we have things called VFD drives on all our fans and all our pumps. What a VFD drive is, is called a variable frequency drive. When our occupancy is low, as said by the CO2, we slow all our pumps down. We slow all our fans down. So instead of bringing in 10,000 CFM, we can go down to as low as 2,000 CFM. That turns a 10 horsepower motor into a 2 horsepower motor, which again is a hydro saver. That turns those two pumps there that are 25 horsepower, that slows them down to maybe 10 horsepower. So it's saving us on hydro when the building isn't fully occupied by monitoring the CO2. And which, that's all automated. All automated, all through this Honeywell building management system. In behind here you'll see these are computer modules. I can open that one so you can have a look out there. These are computer modules right here that sense, they sense temperature, they sense CO2, they sense the speed of the motors, and that's all done through building management, all through software. It's all programmed into it, and, it, and basically it's hands off. We, we don't do much with it as long as there's no problem with it. So that's how, 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 how we slow, we save on horsepower right. by means of VFD drives, by knowing how many people are in the space. Do you know offhand if there's any change in the efficiency, for example, when we're, when we're talking about uh, bringing in the air and, and uh, using the, the, the outgoing air uh, heat, uh, heat via the heat coils, is there any change in the efficiency depending on if we're running at full capacity or at... No, because the heat wheel, there's a wheel up there yeah. that again has a VFD drive on and the fan motor has a VFD drive. So when we don't want as much fresh air, we slow down the wheel, we slow down the speed, which slow down the transfer. The unit basically runs at about an 85% transfer rate. In other words, of all the air, the temperature going out, we transfer about 85% of the heat in the air that's coming in. So we've got to make up about 15%. Not bad, no, that's pretty good. It's one of three in Canada. Like we've had people from all over Canada to come to. That was made specially made and engineered uh, by Engineered Air in uh, Calgary. They designed and built that. I think it was built in Newmarket though, but it is Engineered Air's head office in Calgary. Um, basically, behind you is the nuts and the bolts of the. Of the yeah. These are the wellheads. So this is the divider. This is there, there's a junction in here. So basically, what's happening here? This. It's the, these pipes here are the ones going out to the ground. These ones here, from here on, are the pipes coming out of the ground. Outside in our well field, we have 66 wells, 400 feet deep. They're out on the east end of the building. Those 66 wells, in turn, come to 11 headers that come into the building. Uh, the advantage of doing it this way is if we get a leak in one well, we can eliminate one header, and we don't lose the entire well field. Um, you hopefully never get a leak in your well field, and we never have had anything in five years had any problems with it. So basically right now, our, our stuff is coming out of the ground at about 44, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're going back into the ground at about 40, 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're dumping about three degrees. What we did was, we wanted to know, we weren't sure exactly whether our well field would be big enough. So what we did, we buried temperature sensors in the well field at 200 feet and at 400 feet. We also buried temperature sensors outside the well field at 200 feet and 400 feet so we could compare the two temperatures. In the winter time, we will we'll be about, and this is in Fahrenheit, unfortunately, I don't talk Celsius, but we will be about eight degrees cooler inside the well field than what it is outside the well field in the winter time. In the summertime, we'll be about a degree, maybe two degrees warmer in the well field than what we are outside. So they were concerned when we first put it in that we may have to add auxiliary heat, such as a gas boiler or something, if the well field wasn't big enough. We've ran five years and never had any problems. So we, we run strictly on the, there is no other source of heat out here other than the ground source. The ground source is strictly the only way of doing it. And that's the whole new wing? The it's whole new wing, 38,000 some square feet. And that's no fossil fuel burns no at all? No fossil fuels are burned at all. It's all done by geothermal. Now at the other end, you move your camera down here, we'll show you how we do the water to water. What these are, are water to water heat pumps. I told you we melt the snow, we heat the floor, and we have a hot water coil on the roof. That's all fluids. So what this unit does is take heat out of the groundwater and transfer it into water that is going underneath 
the, the interlock going underneath the floor and feeding up to the up to the makeup air unit on the roof. So these are called water to water because they transfer pull from water to water, not water to air like the rooftop units do. It isn't pure water. It's got, of course, an antifreeze in it because, of course, it would freeze underneath the interlock. So we run about a 50% glycol, which is polypropylene, environmentally friendly glycol, to to 50% water mixture on, on the fluids for the water to water. If you turn your camera this way, you'll see the VFD drives for the pump. And on there, right, we run, we only run one pump at a time. They alternate every other day. But this pump now you can see is running at about 71%. So basically what's happening is our building management system has sensed that we don't need a full load. So we're running at about a little less than three quarters of what the whole building is capable of doing. That at night, when we go into unoccupied, will actually go down to about 40%. When we're in, un depending on if it's a really cold night or not. The other thing you'll notice that we did, as long as we're here, you'll see the blocks. Those blocks are recycled material. They're recycled wood chips and plastic, which are molded into block. They snap together like Lego, and then they're filled with concrete down the middle. And if you notice, most of the outside walls on the building are, are done with that because they have a higher R value, and they're using all recycled material. All the carpet that's in the library is recycled material. The lumber that you notice when you see the tongue and groove is all hemlock, which they consider a weed wood because it grows so quick and repopulates itself. So all the wood is in a hemlock instead of using, you know, spruce or pine. The hemlock grows quicker and it's considered an Ontario weed wood by who we did. So if you look at the tongue and groove and most of the ceiling is done by hemlock. The other thing you'll notice if you look at the outside of the building, you'll see there's an A-frame on this side of the building. The building is equipped to accept solar tags. They were taken out because they couldn't afford them in the budget, but the, the panels are built to accept solar electricity if and when we get the money to put them on the roof. And the roof was designed at an angle to give the maximum sun load to the south facing wall. So there is mounting brackets up there and they're all ready to go as soon as we get the money to do it. The other thing we have outside is a windmill. You've all seen the windmill. In the the windmill provides 9.9 .9 kilowatts of electricity into the lighting grid for the new wing. We don't store it, we don't have any battery capacity, but we do dump it into the lighting grid on a continuous basis when the windmill's in operation. Why don't we have any storage capacity? Because in order to store batteries, you got to get into a whole lot of code because it's an institutional. We'd uh, pretty well have to build a separate room strictly for batteries because of the acid, because of the ventilation and it just wasn't feasible. The windmill was actually donated by Power One, so the cost was kept minimal. So it dumps into the into the lighting grid of the new wing. There is a meter that is in the electrical room that I can show you that will actually tell you exactly how much electricity you're getting at any one time and how many RPMs you're at at any one time. Uh, other things in the new wing that are kind of unique, everyone knows of the CAWT. Yes. We basically treat our own waste. So the waste from this facility is pumped out to a pit that's in behind the pest building. It's got a candy cane coming up. Looks like a big candy cane out there. It is then recycled back in and gets treated through the Center for Our waste, Wastewater Treatment. Because we don't have a license, we have to dump that water still back down the drain, but the water that goes down the drain is basically clean water. So we treat our own waste in, on the washrooms in the new way. Um, Pretty well, other than that, they've pretty well covered everything that we've got on it. Uh, the biggest things on energy is that we monitor people by CO2 meters. Um, we've got VFD drives on all our big horsepower loads. Uh, the ACUP air unit on the roof is state-of-the-art, 85% efficient. Um, and everything out here is completely done through ground source heating and air conditioning. So, Any chance we can get a look at the roof? Or? Sure, we can go up on the roof. Pumps that, that circulate all the time. They circulate the ground loop. These okay. pumps will only run sprag. This is the cooling coil pump for the air, for the rooftop. This is the heating coil for the rooftop pump. Okay. That's the snow melt pump. This is the snow melt. Yep. This is the in-floor heating. And the other thing I didn't tell you, I forgot to tell you. In the winter time, the other way we dump heat is we we have a heat exchanger in front of. We have a main hot water plant for the entire college. This preheats the water going into our gas-fired boiler in the main campus. Oh, cool. So we do preheat the hot water for the entire building before it goes into the hot water. We bring it from, a, the water out of the ground, out of the Lindsay water is about 44 degrees. 
we get it up to about 72 before it enters the gas-fired boiler to get it up to 120, which is what we discharge hot water in the building. So we do do that as well with what heat we reject. So this is contributing to the efficiency of the of for the, the domestic hot water. For domestic hot water. What's oh, cool. that? But these pumps mm. don't run all the time. They'll only run when there's a demand. Where mm. the other two, the big horsepower ones. Basically what it is, is this is a well that was drilled by a drilling program. Um, there's seven of them under the, under the building that we tied into the system, just to incorporate the students' work with the project. They drilled the wells, the students, and we tied them into the system. Um, originally that wasn't uh, all marked up, so you could actually see the flow. In the, they put little eyeglasses there with, with the little dials, paddle wheels, that you could actually see the flow going through the, through the well. Hold up here. You go around with Cool. So this is where the windmill comes from, comes into, right here. The feeds into our lighting grid, that's the wiring diagram that shows the schematic of how it's tied in. Um, we don't run the windmill as much in the winter time because we did have an issue with ice flying off the blades and it actually sliced a hole through the old tilapia building tarp. So they do disable it in the winter time now because of ice and safety concerns. It should never be built that close to the, the main, main reason they put the windmill there, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's like a, a sundial effect. I mean, it's yeah. supposed to be the center. It doesn't do that, but that's the idea. Of it. So there is in the plans to move the windmill further away from the building into an open field where it will be able to run on a continuous basis. And these are those same recycled uh, bricks? Same bricks all the way around. All the outside walls are like that. Now the other thing we did do in this building that is kind of unique is um, we've gone with a built with a uh, power logic breaker system. In other words, our lighting is all controlled computerized now and through uh, sensors that sense people moving. Yeah. Um, so when the room is empty, the lights go out. Um, and we can program, we can actually program breakers to shut off various things on schedules which uh, instead of you know having to depend on people to go around and shut computers off, we can program a bank of plugs to go out on, on, on a program if we want to. That's a heat recovery unit. Uh, again, it's capable of moving in 10,000 CFM of fresh air into the building and exhausting 10,000 CFM of stale air when, we, uh, when our energy management system calls for peak capacity. It'll go down to as low as 2,000 CFM um, at uh, minimum capacity. Uh, it has a uh, month or humidifier in it, it has VFD drives, and it has a nine foot heat wheel, which is what transfers the, the heat from the stale air being exhausted into the fresh air that's coming in. Um, it also has UV lighting in it that will sterilize the air as well, what's coming in. Uh, if you look over there, you'll see the sloped roof that is there for the future uh, solar tags, if and when we get them. Uh, other things are these solar, these uh, skylights are in again to provide natural lighting into the library, and the windows to the to the right here are here to provide natural light into the hallway. 